going here again. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of sharing. Thank you for the word of God that's able to save our souls. Right now, we commit this time to you, God, to understand your word. Walk therein, be changed thereby to the image of your son, that we might have fellowship with you through him by the Holy Spirit, that in these last days we can stand in the midst of a fiery furnace and not be burned, knowing this, that this gospel will bring about all kinds of changes in the inner man and the outer circumstances. And we have to be adaptable to the changes and stand and fight like never before for our lives and the lives of others that are in darkness, bound by the devil, and they don't even know it. So God, give us the intestinal fortitude by the Holy Spirit to stand in austere times and be an example and a witness for the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, today we're going to talk about a hardcore generation. A hardcore generation. Everything about this generation is hardcore, a lot different from what we were brought up in, a lot of us, and that has changed. It's a harder, more stoic, what the Bible calls stiff necked generation. You think you need a battle axe to break this thing down as far as the, the hardness of the heart. But we're going to deal with God's remedy for hardness and, and the fact that he recognizes a hardness about people. But the main thrust of what we're going to talk about is what causes a person to get hard. It's, it's a reason why you get hard inside and you can't be told anything and you got a bone head. Now, you can tell somebody something 35 times, and that bonehead just stands there looking at you, can't hear you because it doesn't want to hear you. So we're going to trace this thing through the Bible and show you both the cause and the remedy for a hardcore generation. Let's begin in Exodus as we begin the journey through the Bible. So only one tool that God uses to explain himself and give you revelation, and that's the word of God, the Bible. Exodus chapter 4, Exodus chapter 4, a very familiar story. You know the story of Moses and Pharaoh. You remember old Charlton Heston in the Ten Commandments dealing with Mo, uh, Pharaoh. He, uh, he was playing Moses. The interaction was God sent Moses to liberate the Israelites and he addressed Pharaoh and told Pharaoh to let God's people go. Look at the interaction here in Exodus 4.21, and the Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh which I have put in thine hand. But I will harden his heart that he shall not let the people go. <clears throat> now look at this. God is telling the man, go and tell Pharaoh to let the people go. Then he says, I will harden his heart so he won't let the people go. Well, why am I going to tell him to let the people go? <laughs> he's dealing with not only the Israelites, but he's dealing with the Egyptians too. He's got to show the Egyptians who he is in comparison to what? The gods of Egypt. See, this, this, you got to understand this about everything we're dealing with. It's all about a battle of the gods. You got to understand, everything you deal with, I don't care if it's your teenager at home, I don't care if it's your work environment, I don't care if it's politicians, I don't care if it's religious endeavors in, a, in the religious arena, everything is about the battle of the titans. God, the ruler of, of all creation, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, pitted against Fallen angels who have made themselves gods. So that's all it's about. All the tribes the Israelites faced in the Old Testament had gods they worshipped. And everything was about the Israelite God versus the God of the Philistines, the Moabites, or the Canaanites, or the Hittites, or the Jebusites, or the Girgashites, anybody they were dealing with. It was all about the God of that tribe that pitted itself against the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, you can see how when Goliath and David were interacting, 
the first thing that Goliath did was what? He cursed David in the name of his God, the Philistine God. He was trying to disempower David through a curse. But David said, I come in the name of the Lord of hosts. You can't curse him. And I'm coming in heavy with just a slingshot and five smooth stones. So everybody's trying to do something and stand against the true and living God under the auspices of their God. You got to know that. If you don't know that, you don't know what this, this uh, cataclysmic struggle is all about. When you're dealing with a man that's against you and you're telling them the truth of the gospel, it's because they have another God. Every human being has a God. If it's not the God of the Bible, it's not Jesus Christ, if it's not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they just have another God. And that God in them that controls their mind is talking through them to cast away from them the true and living God. You have to know that before you deal with this because if you don't, you'll start dealing with people back and forth. You'll get what you get on Facebook all day, debates back and forth. I mean, you can talk forever about any given topic, but what's the answer? What's the truth? What's the conclusion of the matter? If somebody can't see it and it's truth, it has to be something in the way that's filtering out the truth that they can't recognize it and see it. They've listened to and believed something else. All right, now, so it says, I'm sending you to Pharaoh, tell him to let the people go, but I'm going to harden his heart. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Israel is my son, my firstborn son. This is God talking. Let my children go is what he's saying. Israel, who was once named Jacob, God sees as his own lineage, his own sons. So he says, you're letting my, you got my family bound. Let them go. But he hardens Pharaoh's heart. Now, how does he do that? To understand how God hardens a heart and, 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 and how a hard heart gets hardened, it's very simple. You can get a lump of clay and you can get butter and sit it out in the sun, both out in the sun. One will get hard and one will melt. What caused the hardness and what caused the melting? Exposure. All God had to do to, to get a, a Pharaoh's heart to harden was expose himself to him. If he had a substance inside of him that would get hard, God revelating himself would make him more stoic. He'd stand up against him. But if he had a soft and pliable heart, what the Bible calls a contrite spirit, a brokenness inside, broken spirit and a contrite heart, then he'd melt. And fall down on the ground and say, what must I do to be saved? You saw the two interactions in the New Testament. People who hardened themselves and people who asked men and brethren, what must we do to be saved? I'm ready to repent. I'm ready to, hey, look, whatever I have to do. So you see how God deals with human beings. If you got a hardened heart, he sends you through a softening process. <laughs> Just like you and me. You had a bonehead. So it's say, you, okay, you got a bone head. I'm going to soften you up a bit. So it lets you live through a living hell. And he asks you, you ready now? You ready yet? No, I see. I, the way I see it, okay, back around the mountain again. You ready now? Well, in my opinion, all right, let you go back around the mountain again. You ready yet? Well, look. There are many ways to look at this. And the way I see it, okay, back around the mountain again. Until you finally say, look, God, what must I do to be saved? Upraised hands is all about surrender. That's why you raise your hands to God. You're surrendering. First thing the police tells you when they're about to arrest you is put your hands up where I can see them. Because you might have a weapon in your hand. So a hardened heart is a defensive heart. It's an antagonistic heart. It's a heart that's going to debate. Most of all, it's known as a stubborn heart, a self-willed heart. That was Pharaoh. So he knew Pharaoh was a proud, arrogant worshiper of another god. So if Moses came in the name of his god and said, Thus saith the Lord to you, let my people go. 
Who are you supposed to be? A stinking, filthy Hebrew, an Israelite? I am the ruler of Egypt. I am Pharaoh, and Pharaoh in Egypt was the son of the gods. He was a god man. And you're going to bring your twinkle-toed, wimpy little god that's got you as slaves to tell me to let these folk go? Man, you better go somewhere and come again. And who do you depend on? Janies and Jambres. You see how everybody that's gotten a hardened heart is reinforced by the magicians and the witchcraft workers. See, the world doesn't realize that they're bewitched. They don't, know, they don't know that Jay-Z is a warlock. They don't know Beyonce is a witch. They don't know Mickey, Nicki Minaj is a witch. They don't know Lady Gaga is a witch. They don't know Oprah is a witch. They don't know that. So they listen to them, ingest the data from them, and walk in it. Styles, fashions, all given by warlocks, witchcraft workers, and perverts. So you go on the internet and see a dress, and a homosexual man designed it, and here you are having your taste infiltrated by the taste of a homosexual man. So here you are walking around showing you behind everybody and your breast everybody, and you look like a nut, and you don't know you look like a nut. All because you were bewitched by a sinister spirit operating in the fashion industry. Instead of you going and getting a taste that came from God and a fashion consciousness that came from God, here you are emulating and following the fashions of this world, the designs of this world. See, the word, the word design is not just germane to the fashion industry. Witches place a design on you. When they design you, what have they done? Huh? They cast a spell. See, a design is a spell. So when you're under the influence of a design, what you're doing is normal to you. You see folks sitting walking around texting all day, on the internet all day. Facebook has become their God. They can't even talk to you in a, in a, in a personal relationship. All they can do is text and, and talk through a computer terminal. Get them one-on-one -on -one in front of you. I don't even know how to interact with a human being. That's what we, be we become. We become bewitched by culture, by technology, and by society at large. So this is why Pharaoh stood up. God hardened him, not by God making him hard, but by just exposing himself to him. And knowing his stoic, proud heart would stand up against the command of God. Everybody that has a hardened heart does the same thing to this very day. They will be contrary to whatever you tell them as a boneheaded boob, not knowing they're about to slit their own throats. You, you, have you ever noticed how silly a person looks and they don't know it? We went out to dinner last night. Beautiful young girl there. I said, man, that's, that could be a classy, sharp girl. I told my wife. And then my wife said, but she got those tattoos going down her back. I said, yeah, that just blew the whole thing. <laughs> Classic little dress, pearls on. I mean, she had, she had a little baby doll outfit on. She looked good. And you turn around and, oh, man, what in the world? You messed your whole look up. But that's what will happen to you when you've been bewitched by the society. You think this looks good, and you don't know you look silly. You know, you ever got a bullhorn and everybody telling you, that looks terrible, that looks terrible, that looks terrible. And you just know it looks good. And everybody knows it looks terrible but you. It's like somebody walking in a room and you walk in with your girlfriends, five of you in your wolf pack at night, you know, out in the club. You know, you're like, you're like Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis Jr., and Dean Martin, the wolf pack in Vegas. You know, they called them the wolf pack, the rat pack, the rat pack in Vegas. So you got a wolf pack, though, that you travel in. You hit the club. One of your girls goes to the restroom and struts back. Man, I walked to the restroom, and I got on this dress and everything, and I know I'm looking like I'm looking. All the guys were checking me out as I walked to the bathroom and back. I get so tired of these guys. 
I mean, you know, they're like they ain't never seen a good looking fine girl before. Like me is what they're saying. Then one of your girlfriends say, but I don't think they were looking at that. You got a booger hanging out your nose. That's what they were looking at. Now you see how you can look, you can make yourself into a fool thinking everybody's looking at you for one thing, and they're really thinking how crazy you look. And you're thinking, they're admiring me. But inside of themselves, they're thinking, man, you look crazy. Never seen nobody look. You, 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 man, you're the epitome of insane in this. But you don't know. Bewitched by the culture and society, not knowing you don't even fit in. You don't, you, it, nothing about you fits into the category of womanhood, virtue, honor, dignity, because whoredoms is the norm in the culture because the culture is bewitched. So if you conform to the culture, you'll think a fashion trend that reflects whoredoms and a 42nd Street hooker is normal. So this is just an example of, one example of, how you become hard thinking this is right and it's totally wrong. It can happen in any endeavor. You know you're right. Wrong is two left shoes. So we're going to just trace this down through the Bible. He hardened Pharaoh's heart through his exposure. So look at Exodus 7, 3. I wonder where they got the name Booger from. That's crazy, isn't it? Exodus 7, 3. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. God speaking. I will harden Pharaoh's heart and as, as a result multiply my signs and wonders. Harden heart. I'm coming with a demonstration in the physical that everybody can see what's going on. A hardened heart. Hard, stoic, set against it. Now I'm going to demonstrate myself in that environment. The contention with God is a result of the demonic elements in the background. Now, what we've come to in, in our particular generation is a time wherein church is basically become useless. Nobody's preaching anything that matters for the most part. It's a ritual you go to, has no effect on the heart, it's just something to bathe folks in something they feel comfortable with. So when they actually run into the real gospel, it becomes offensive. See, the real gospel offends everybody that's going to religion because I've never heard this before, so this can't be right. Don't judge what's right or wrong based on your experience because your experience could be all wrong. What do you judge what's right or wrong by? The word of God. Is it true what's being told to you? Don't get into religious, religious systems and believe just because it's got church on the front of it, it's the church of Jesus Christ. And it's preaching the gospel and it has anything to do with God. You have to examine environments and what's said based on the word of God. But how can you examine an environment if you don't know the word of God? That's terrifying. To go into any environment and take face value, carte blanche, that this is true with, without having a way to evaluate it. I just believe it because somebody said it. That's crazy. That is crazy. What, who would ever do something like that? Somebody just telling you something your eternal life, heaven or hell, is, is resting on this, what they're, they're, they're telling you, and you don't know if it's true or not, and you just believe it. Not me, man. I've got to evaluate everything. I've got to go find out if what you just told me is real. I've got to have my own study time to study to show myself approval, workman needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I've got to have my own prayer time. I've got to have my own tools, my own lunchbox, my own pick and shovel. I'm not looking for anybody to supply me with my stuff because I got to get in for me. Work out your salvation for yourself with fear and trembling. Every man must bear his own burden. 
nobody to blame. By your words, you will be justified. By your words, you will be condemned. Don't look at secondhand stuff to make it in. Because what if somebody else dies? What if your husband or your wife dies? Now what are you going to do if you're piggybacking? Can't piggyback on this man. I got to go vertical with God. Get a relationship established. So no matter what happens on the horizontal, I'm yoked to God and he can actually talk to me and direct me and lead me. A lot of folks are depending on memberships and organizations to go to heaven. You'll never make it. Because he won't know you. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. I don't know you. And they're going to come saying, Lord, have I not cast out devils in your name? Have I not prophesied in your name? Have I not done marvelous works in your name? Depart from me, you worker of iniquity, is Jesus' response. I never, not that I once knew you, I never knew you. Fine. Legal my whole life that were never accounted for in heaven before God. And I thought this would get me in. Terrifying. Exodus 14, 4. These are the days of terror. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after them. And I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his host that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord and they did so. So what again? Not only is he hardening his heart to show signs and wonders, but he's hardening his heart so that he will be honored among the Egyptians. They're going to respect me. I'm going to make them respect me. So a hardened heart and God goes in operation to demonstrate himself to show that he is God and he's going to Make this generation know he's God. Just wait. Verse 17, same chapter. And I beheld, I will heart, and I, behold, will harden the hearts of the Egyptians. Now this is the, all, this is all the Egyptians now. And they shall follow them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. So what is he saying now? I'll harden all of their hearts and they're going to follow you into the Red Sea. Think about this now. Look at how, look at how stupid this is when you got a hardened heart. You're following the Israelites out of Egypt. You they God first of all puts a pillar of fire between you and them. That's enough to make me go back right there. At that point, I said, I think you know what, Tom. We, yeah, we better go on back to Egypt and uh, just forget this. Y'all. Yeah, we take our chance with Pharaoh being mad at us or whatever, but. You stall by a pillar of fire. While the fire is holding you up, the Red Sea parts. Think about this. The Red Sea parts, they go over on dry ground. They make it across. Now, you go charging into the sea after them. What's holding the water up? It's plain to see that whoever held the water up did it because you were chasing them. So it would it was tend to reason that the same person that parted the sea to get them away from you is not going to let you come across the sea to catch them. A hardened heart does what to you? Blinds the mind. You don't know you're crazy. You don't know how bad you look. You don't know you look stupid. You don't know the folks are saying contrary things about you. You think everybody's jealous of you. When folks are just trying to tell you, you're killing yourself. You're going crazy. Oh, you just don't understand. A hardened heart. And they went charging into the Red Sea. And you, you know those songs. Pharaoh's army got drowned. It. Oh, Mary, don't you weep, don't you moan. They went into the sea after them. And the Bible said that sea un unfolded on top of them. Everybody was drowned in the sea. If you go to the bottom of the Red Sea right now, what you're going to find is old chariot wheels and old reins or whatever they were driving those horses with. It's all down there. 
See, God has power. And the hope of mankind is, is that God doesn't unleash the power before they get saved. Because you don't want to see God angry. The Bible says he's angry with, angry with the wicked all day long. Look at what the Bible says about a hardened heart. Look at Proverbs. Well, first of all, let's look at 2 Kings. 2 Kings 17. Try to keep, keep, keep it on a little track here through the Bible. 2 Kings 17. Look at verse um, 13. He says, Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers, saying, Turn you from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you by my servants the prophets. Notwithstanding, they would not hear, but hardened their necks like to the neck of their fathers that did not believe in the Lord their God, and they rejected his statutes and his covenant that he made with their fathers and his testimonies which he testified against them. And they followed vanity and became vain and went after the heathen that were round about them concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. Don't be like the heathen. That's why you keep telling your kids, stop being like the heathen. God is going to judge the heathen and destroy them and you're enraptured with the heathens. And they left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made them molten images, even two calves, and made a grove and worshipped all the host of heaven and served Baal. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and used divination and enchantment and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Therefore, the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah only. Also, Judah kept not the commandments of the Lord their God, but walked in the statutes of Israel which they made. Which they made. And the Lord rejected all the seed of Israel and, and, and afflicted them and delivered them into the hand of spoilers. And you know the spoilers are now demons. A judgment of God is to turn you over to the demons. And you're looking at a slew of people in society that have been uh, turned over to the demons for what? Chastening. God used the demons to chasten folks. How does he turn you over to the demons? Just back off of you. The demons will come in. They're going to just leave you alone. <laughs> The demons are always their way, don't you? Yes. The only thing that stays in the hand of demons is God's presence. All they have to do is just back off of you and leave you to your own devices using your own carnal mind to try to figure out what to do every day. And you think up junk and you plan out stuff and you're falling right into the hands of the demons. Because the carnal mind is yoked to whom? The demons. You think like them by nature. You'll be just like them by nature because the carnal mind is a fallen Adamic mind that is in covenant with the devil and his demons. So nobody does what they want to do. They do what the devil desires them to do because your mind is a conduit for the thoughts of the devil. You just don't know that. You made up a lot of stuff that you had planned out in the world. How you going to get somebody? How you going to dress when you going to seduce them? Plan all played out. You didn't know the person had AIDS. You didn't know they were a, a killer. Will beat your head to death. You don't know. See, folks come with a package. You don't just get the person. You get all the demons. All the folks they've had sex with. All that comes as a package. So your mind begins to corrupt and erode away because you got a package deal. Package was wrapped good. Looked good. Smell good. She was fine. It's like they used to say, California wine. But boy, it was a package deal. 
Fine can carry AIDS and gonorrhea too. It's the devil at his best. When you think you know according to sight, sound, and your five carnal senses, that's the way to be deceived. It looks good, sounded good, smelled good, the luscious lips tasted good, and you touched them and they really felt good. All that was playing on your senses, but you didn't know embedded in all that sense-driven attraction was demons with a lure, with enticement. If you're going to bait a trap, you got to bait it with something you want. Why are you going to try to trap a lion and put carrots in the trap? A lion is a carnivore. He don't want no carrots. Put a steak in the trap. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trap this tiger. Give me some lettuce. No, look. You're going to trap a rabbit. So what's the devil spend time doing to you? Examining you. He, he circles you like a stalking lion stalking his prey. What's he doing? He's evaluating you. He's seeing what you like. He knows what kind of brethren you like. He knows what kind of sistering you like. He knows everything about you because he's taking the time to study you, to stalk you. He's got spirit beings assigned to you to watch you and what appeals to you. He knows what you want to hear. He knows that you got hurt in certain areas. You know how he knows that? Because he did it to you. <laughs> he knows you've been rejected by guys so he can come and massage you to make you feel better. So you'll have five guys reject you so the sixth guy will make you feel better. Five guys will call you fat. The sixth guy will call you fine. That's how he does it. And you got that wound from the other five guys. Now the sixth guy makes you feel good. And you need outward circumstances to keep trying to sign off on you, validate you, verify you, vindicate you. All this stuff from the outside and the devil wounded you on the inside to make you search on the outside for acceptance. You'll spend your whole life like that until you're born again. See, being born again is a relief. It's a release from captivity and the bondage the devil put on you. But see, to deal with hardcore people who have hardcore problems in a hardcore generation you got to bring the gospel in a hardcore fashion or else they will not hear you. You have to explicitly talk about the circumstances of life and what people are living through so their minds can identify with the fact that I did that and that's me. I thought that. I've, I've actually thought what, you, what he just said. Folks even go so far to think, who told him? what I did. Somebody been talking to him before I got here, so when I got here, <laughs> see, now they trying to, uh -huh, I don't like this place. Y'all go trying to tell that guy what I did. And now I'm over here and everybody looking at me because everybody been told about me. I can't stand. Look, nobody's telling anybody anything about you. The Holy Ghost will sift through you. He'll search you out and he'll see what you've done, tell you about it with one goal in mind. Repent, turn from your wicked, evil ways, and be saved from this wicked, perverse, and untaught generation. That's all he's after. God is not here to do anybody bad. He's here to do everybody good. Look what he says. For he rent Israel from the house of David, and they, and they made Jeroboam the son of Nebat king. And Jeroboam drove Israel from following the Lord and made them sin and a great sin. For the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did. They departed not from them until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight as he had said by all his servants the prophets. So was Israel carried away out of their own land to Assyria unto this day. Now you know the Assyrians were the captives of Israel before the Babylonians, right? They went through several captivities. They were passed around like 
uh, an old harlot. They went from Assyria to Babylon to Medo-Persia to Greece. When Jesus came, they were right there with Rome. Why? Because they wouldn't remain faithful to God. What's happening to the church? Being passed around like an old harlot. Church folks are getting pimped by preachers because they won't turn to God. So God gives them over to the preachers. And you get pimped. All your money, all your resources, all this junk you give to the preacher. He's riding around in a Bentley and a Rolls Royce at your expense. And you can't see it because you think this is how God is. This is religion. This is how God actually manifests himself. This is normal. You've been brainwashed. You know how I many people just like a whore on the street will defend the pimp preacher? Do you know a harlot being pimped by a pimp will fight to the death for the pimp? And that's the same way pimp folks in church will fight for a preacher. They stand up against the truth because if what you're saying is true, what I've been taught is wrong, and you're now coming against the preacher that taught it to me, so therefore, I don't like you. I harden my heart against you in favor of a man that lied to me. I saw two prostitutes in the streets of Miami almost beat each other to death because one prostitute said something derogatory about the other prostitute's pimp. And those girls were tearing off clothes, tearing off wigs and weave and breaking each other in half about a pimp that cared less than nothing about them. That's exactly how folks are doing about these folks in these pulpits. That guy doesn't even know your name. And doesn't want to know your name. All you are is a giving unit. You're a tithe payer. And you know, tithing came into existence in the 5th or 6th century in the Roman Catholic Church as a way to make money. That's not even germane to the New Testament. Look how many people believe in tithing and it's not even a New Testament doctrine. 2 Corinthians 6, 9, 6. Give grudgingly, not grudgingly, nor of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Don't give grudgingly, nor of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And he's able to make all grace abound toward you. Tithing in Deuteronomy, go check it out, was agricultural. For the priest to have food to eat. You gave him a tenth of your field supply. So they had food. I might have my storehouse for what, God? To feed my priest. Roman Catholicism realized that we got these big, huge cathedrals. And they've got to be financed. So we'll divine on the people an Old Testament doctrine to make them believe that tithing is still in vogue. We'll have a category of men called priests in Catholicism. And you're bringing your money now to the storehouse. And they changed the, the whole setup to accommodate Roman Catholicism and running game to get money into the church. It came right into Protestant churches and it's, it's still here today with folks yelling at you, you're cursed with a curse if you don't pay 10% of your money. And all divined up would be which folk want to know is, is that the gross or is it the net that we, what? you've been bewitched. It doesn't even exist. What's the New Testament doctrine? Give and it shall be given. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together, running over, will men give into your bosom. Giving. What's giving? What is your giving orchestrated by? And who is it orchestrated by? The Holy Ghost. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Nobody can command you from a pulpit to give 10% of anything. If they do, that's a false prophet with a false doctrine and he's brought you back under the law and the law is not made for a righteous man. The law is made for fornicators, adulterers, and every evil worker. 
You can't get to God through laws. So the New Testament really doesn't call it the law. It really, it, that word there in the Greek is really laws. You can't serve God with laws. What law do we walk in? The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus which sets us free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in it, it was, it was weak through sinful flesh. God sent his only begotten son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemn sin in Jesus' flesh and set you free. And folks go right back to the vomit of the law and try to serve God through performance because they've been bewitched and brainwashed just like the foolish Galatians in Galatians chapter 3. The man said explicitly, O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Have begun in the Holy Spirit, in the Spirit, are you now made perfect in the flesh? Man, go on and say, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of you. What's wrong with you? Captivated, bound by law. Why? You haven't finish with the sin. Everybody that goes back to the law is sin conscious. When you're sin conscious, you try to work it out some kind of a way to make God accept you. But when you're God conscious and free, you know you're accepted and beloved and I don't have to do anything because I'm in. All I do now is just obey God and do what he tells me because I'm a member of the household of faith. I'm a son of God. He has nothing against me because I've been set free. In Jesus. And where the spirit of the Lord is. There is liberty. And who the son is set free. Is free indeed. Don't bind me with your Sabbath day worship. Sabbath day Adventist. Don't bind me with your tithe paying word of faith fellow. Don't bind me. With all your rules and rituals. The Bible says touch not taste not handle not. Which has a form or show of godliness and will worship but not holding the head, the foundation, which is Jesus Christ. Man, come on. All the law is going to make you is a rigid legalist. It's going to make you proud, and you're going to take the word of God like a hammer or, 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 or a club and beat people to death with it. You say, well, Mr. Price, you preach hard. I'm cutting through you to get to you to transform you to make you a vessel of God. You're not, you're not called to take the word and use it. You're called to take the word and let it absorb into you to change you. Folks take messages and they're sitting there thinking of who it applies to. You know, my cousin Leroy. You know what? That's just like him. He's proud. No, it ain't for your cousin Leroy. Your cousin Leroy is not here. It's apparent God can be dealing with your cousin Leroy because he's not sitting here. So he must be dealing with me. See, I could say you, but I'm hearing what I'm saying too, and I'm con I convict myself a lot of times sitting here. You just don't know it. <laughs> I, I keep looking straight ahead. Nobody knows. <laughs> oh, that just hit me. <laughs> <laughs> what can you do? It is what it is. I'm not going to shut up. You get before God, you pray and let, let the Holy Ghost take control. He'll convict you, me, everybody. You say at the end of the message, I repent. I say, hey, Lord, I drive down the street. I sure repent. I know I messed up. I was till I was the other day and heard that myself. I tell you the truth. That, God, that, that sword sure will cut a lot of different ways, won't it? It will. That's how it works. If you want to be saved, you got to go through the process. Look, God has a sword in his hand. But God uses the sword a lot of ways. It can be used as a weapon to dice folk up and cut them up. It can be used as a scalpel to cut out in a surgical fashion the thing in you, cut it out. And then pour in some healing balm and heal you back up. God uses that sword a lot of ways. It's a two-edged sword. So what I'm saying is this. To get dealt with by God is painful. 
It is. Yes, it is. Whom the Lord loves, it says in Hebrews, he chastens and he scourges. He whips everybody's butt that he receives. Yes. That's the way it goes. Yes. It's painful. But think about this. Now, these, are the, these are the two options you have. You can have a disease in you a, a malignant tumor in you that's cancerous. The surgeon can either do one of two things. He can open you up, see the tumor, close you up, and send you on your way. We can open you up, cut it out, pour in healing balm, close you back up again, and then you'll go through a process of healing, and you'll be better at the end. If I had two options, I'd rather have the guy cut out the malignancy and let me heal up as opposed to leaving the malignancy in me knowing I'm going to die from it but treat me like I'm all right. False religion and churches preach to you messages that are in the Bible that will do you no good. T.D. James yelling at you, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, ain't doing you no good. Your breakthrough is on the way. It's been on the way now for 10 years. How many times, woman, are you going to be loosed? You've been to the woman, thou art loose them now 75 times, and you ain't loose yet. How many times you been tied up to be loose that many times? You see how crazy everything is? It's just religious gymnastics. But guess what? Since you don't cut into me and remove this malignant tumor, I'll sit here and pretend I'm all right with you. Just don't let me feel the pain and hurt and anguish of cutting into me to heal me. There is a balm in Gilead, but guess what? The balm is applied after the surgery. We got to cut out the problem. Somebody got to cut in to cut out what's got you bound. And God will do that. Life is hard. Life is painful. You're not going to live down here in a happy-go-lucky, everything's lovely, tiptoe through the tulip type environment. Life is hard. We, you know, the faster you accept that fact, the better off you'll be. It's not an easy ride in. Look at 1 Samuel. We'll do a sprint through 1 Samuel because this is very important. 1 Samuel lays out this hardened heart so beautifully. 1 Samuel chapter 3. I'll read it straight through here because it's so, it's so de descriptive as far as what's wrong with everybody. 1 Samuel chapter 3. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. See how the Lord's word is precious when there's no open vision? Like right now? To, you know how hard it is to find the word of God right now? People go to church all day. They don't even get the word of God. They get emotional massages. They get promises that are not fulfilled. Your breakthrough's on the way. Your blessing's on the way. Your time. I mean, a word for me. A, all this stuff that's going on is always a promise for the future. Some breakthrough's on the way. Something's about to happen to you. I feel this thing coming on you. Get ready. God is on the way. God showed me this is your time. This is your season. This is your... All that stuff massaging sinners because the preachers and the, and the prophets and the ministers are not cutting out malignancy. So folks want to sit up and get pablum and you know pablum is made for what? Babies. Tilly wink little baby doctrine, little Gerber's baby food and you are in the church for 35 years still eating pablum. Gerber's. Man, go on and get some meat and potatoes and get on with it. This has become silly. So, no open vision. The word of God was precious. That's what we got now. Man, to find the word of God is a precious thing. Because, man, you can go a million places and just get garbage all day long. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim that he, would, that he could not see. 
And ere the lamp of God went out of the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep. That the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here am I. And he ran unto Eli. He ran unto Eli and said, here, I, here, here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I called not. Lie down again. And he went and lay down. And here's a man that doesn't know the voice of God, Samuel. He heard somebody, heard somebody calling him, so he figured Eli called him. He said, Eli, you call me? Man, I didn't call you. Go back and lay down. I, don't, I didn't call you. What you doing? And the Lord called yet again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. Here is, now listen to what I'm about to say, especially y'all by Stick'em, Facebook, Twitter, MySpace, your space, their space, and everybody's space. Listen. <laughs> Stop pretending you're hearing from God when you're not. Stop pretending the Lord told you something and he didn't. You get on Facebook and you make yourself look silly when you try to put stuff out there that's not germane to the Bible and it's coming out of your own mind. If you speak not according to the law and the prophets, you end up being accursed. God, I was, I was driving down the street and the Lord told me. I was standing in Kroger and the Lord told me to buy these apples. I was at the shoe store and the Lord said, buy these shoes. Look, stop. Folks tell you they hear from the Lord like he said that to them right now, telling them right now. And you know, the Lord just told me. Uh, you tell them, tell them something. Yeah, the Lord already told me that. The Lord showed me. The Lord spoke. Look, stop. When the Lord speaks, there's power. There's, there's some results. It manifests something. It's not just all this, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be, if he, shall, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in this place, and the Lord came and stood and called uh, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Now imagine you asleep, you, you're sleeping at night. Nobody home but you. Now you hear a voice. Omar? Omar. Now you're diving out of the bedroom window, yelling, running through the woods with your pajamas on, diving into a lake and swimming. Look! <laughs> why would you be afraid? If it's the devil, why would you be afraid? It's just the devil. What are we afraid of? I'm a born again believer, baptized in the spirit, blood bought, blood bathed, blood saved, and I'm diving out of the window running. Whether it be God or the devil is really in, in, inconsequential. If it's the devil, rebuke him, bind him, slap him, whatever. If it's God, listen. What? You know what it is? Too much Steven Spielberg, too much George Lucas, too much Dracula, too much Wolfman, and whatever other scary movie you looked at. That's, that's why the devil did that. So the supernatural and the spirit world is now fearful and scary. He's got, he's got one leg up on you already then. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose and, and said, Lord, I'm here to speak. Therefore, Eli said unto Samuel, go lie down. And he lied down again, and God came. He spoke to him. He said in verse 10, that Samuel answered, speak for your servant hears. And the Lord said to Samuel, behold, I will do a thing in Israel, at which both the ears of everyone that hears it shall tingle. That's about to happen right now. God's going to do something that none of us would believe. Looking at this, you're looking at this and saying, this is beyond salvation. You might as well just burn it up tonight because these people are not savable. He's going to cause ears to tingle. And that day I will perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will make an end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows. 
because his sons made themselves vile and he restrained them not. What did he do? His sons were in the tabernacle of the Most High God fornicating with the young women in Israel. And he said, you better stop these boys or I'm going to kill everything in sight. And Eli didn't have the guts to tell his sons to stop. Afraid of his own sons. And therefore I've sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. And Samuel lay until the morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord and Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he answered, Here am I. And he said, What is the thing that the Lord hath said unto thee? I pray thee, hide it not from me. God do so to thee and more also if thou hide anything from me of, of all the things that he said unto thee. He said, Whatever God told you about me or whatever he told you, may the thing come on you if you don't tell me what he said. So you know at that point, well, I might as well <laughs> And Samuel said, uh, told him every wit and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seemeth him good. That's Eli. It's Lord, whatever he wants to do. It's the Lord. And Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and did let none of his words fall to the ground. What's he mean by falling to the ground? Everything he said came to pass. How do you know the words of a prophet? What they say will happen and and all Israel from Dan even to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord and the Lord appeared again to, to in Shiloh for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord so this is what I'm saying somebody has to break through to start hearing and all you do all prophecy is and all preaching is and all proclamation is it's repeating what God said. See, if you repeat what God said, it's going to happen. If you say what you believe and what you think, nothing will happen. So he, now look what happened. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. This is verse chapter 4. Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle and pitched beside Ebenezer. And the Philistines pitched in Aphek. And the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel, and when they joined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines, and they slew of the army in the field about 4,000 men. And when the people were coming to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore have the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of Milo unto us, that when it comes among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. So man, we, we got beat up by the Philistines. We got, we got wounded pretty bad. They tore us apart. Go down to Shiloh. Bring the ark up here. The presence of God. With the presence of God in our midst, we become invincible. They knew when God was with them, he fought for them, and nobody could stand against them. So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from thence the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts, which dwells between the, the, the cherubims and the two sons of Eli Hophni and Phinehas were there with the ark of the covenant of God the fornicators are with the ark two cherubim angels with those outstretched wings over the ark and the ark set down be between the cherubims bring the ark up here and when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp all Israel shouted with a great shout so that the earth rang again. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What meant the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that the ark of the Lord was coming to the camp. And the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God is coming to the camp. And they said, Woe unto us, for there have not been such a thing heretofore. Woe unto us, who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? Notice how they saw God as gods because the Philistines had multitudes of gods and they figured, they figured the Israelites did too. These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. See how the, see how the fame of what God had did had, had spread? That's why all the tribes in Canaan land were afraid of them. They had heard that this God will destroy you. This God does not play with you. Be strong. Look what he says. 
Be, these are the Philistines talking. Be strong and quit yourselves like men. Now, what, what, what scripture does that remind you of? Remember 1 Corinthians 16, 13, he says, quit you, ye like men and be strong. The word quit means to commit and make a stand like a man. Com commit to this. So the Philistines are saying, quit like men, O you Philistines, that you be not servants unto the Hebrews as they have been to you. Saying, you know, look, stand up strong against this God. Get adamant, get strong, get hard. So you won't be a slave like the, like the he Hebrews have been to you. We're not going to bow before their God. We're going to fight. As they have been to you, quit yourself like men and fight. And the Philistines fought, and Israel was, and they fled every man into his tent. And there was a very great slaughter for their fellow the Israelites, 30,000 footmen. And the ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. What happened? Two fornicators, two sons of the priest, defiling the temple. They bring the ark in, thinking the presence of God would secure the victory. And God let them fall and fail. Why? Sin in the camp. Sin within the confines of the tribes. Now you know the rest of the story. A man ran and told Eli what happened. Eli was a fat man. What the Bible said, Eli fell backwards and died. A big fat man. <laughs> And his daughter-in-law, look at verse 19, Phineas, his wife, was with child. So you see, they were fornicating and committing adultery. He had a wife who was pregnant. She was near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself in travail for her pains came upon her. So she went into, into delivery, went into labor. And about the time of her death, the women that stood by her said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast borne a son. But she answered not, neither did she regard it. Look what she said. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glorious departed from the ark of God was taken. And because of her father-in-law and their husband, and she said, The glorious departed from Israel, for the ark of God is taken. Ichabod means what? Where is the glory? There is no glory. The glory is departed. Ichabod is written on the door of all these churches. No God. No presence. Dead ritualism. Going through the motions. Nobody even expects anything to happen at church. No deliverance. No demons cast out. No healings. No signs. No wonders. No miracles. No manifestation of the presence of Almighty God to do something. Just going through the rituals. So we have to turn back to preparation. Get the ground right. The spirit of Elijah comes for preparation. To prepare the people for Jesus to manifest himself. You got to turn the hearts back to the fathers and away from the mothers and the matriarchs. You got to make folks patriarchal again so God can move again. You got to turn them away from the world and meditation their own. To God again. They got to repent. See preparation and groundwork has to be laid. To turn people from the dead gods of the world. And religion that they call church. Another Jesus. Another gospel. Another spirit according to 2 Corinthians 11.4. Going through all the rituals of nothingness. No manifestations. No God. No power. And just going to church every Sunday and Wednesday night. This is useless. At a, at a minimum, it's useless. As a maximum, it's stupid. Why get offended about it when you know there's nothing happening? Before we get to the reality of God, we got to first realize the reality of what we're really in. Nothing is happening. God is not offending if I tell God, you know, God, nothing's going on. He knows. he knows it. You're not giving him a revelation. If this is maximum God, you might as well worship your shoes. Think about it. If God is doing nothing, and your shoes aren't going to do anything, 
Worship your shoes.